Hi, I'm Jess, part-time hobbit, and I'm here to talk to you about Tolkien. We are just a few days away from Christmas when this video is coming out. I figured what better way to celebrate the holiday than with J.R.R. Tolkien's Letters from Father Christmas. This is an absolutely wonderful collection of all of the letters that Tolkien wrote supposedly from Father Christmas to his children all the way from 1920 to 1943. For tonight's video, I am just going to read along and we're gonna have a little bit of story time. And I'm gonna have to keep things a little quiet because there are some cute little rats sleeping over here. And if they wake up, I'm gonna have to move them to another room. Stop eating the fake plants, stop. So grab your blanket and your nice warm drink and let's read. So we'll start with the introduction. To the children of J.R.R. Tolkien, the interest and importance of Father Christmas extended beyond his filling of their stockings on Christmas Eve, for he wrote a letter to them every year in which he described in words and pictures his house, his friends, and the events hilarious or alarming at the North Pole. The first of the letters came in 1920, when John, the eldest, was three years old. And for over 20 years, through the childhoods of three other children, Michael, Christopher, and Priscilla, they continued to arrive each Christmas. Sometimes the envelopes, dusted with snow and bearing polar postage stamps, were found in the house on the morning after his visit. Sometimes the postman brought them, and the letters that the children wrote themselves vanished from the fireplace when no one was about. It goes on to summarize everything that's about to happen, but we'll get to that in its due time. The 22nd of December, 1920. Dear John, I heard you ask Daddy what I was like and where I lived. I have drawn me and my house for you. Take care of the picture. I am just now off for Oxford with my bundle of toys. Some for you. Hope I shall arrive in time. The snow is very thick at the North Pole tonight. Your loving Father Christmas. I love the simplicity of this first letter accompanied with how detailed the art is. As you'll come to see with these letters, the complexity of the letters and art is hugely dependent on what was happening with the family at the time, which Father Christmas usually explains away in his letters, but it gives you a really, really interesting insight into the daily life of the Tolkien family. The text of this first letter is very simple, which makes sense because he was writing for one three-year-old but the art is very beautiful and detailed. Christmas Eve, 1923. My dear John, it is very cold today and my hand is very shaky. I am 1924, no, seven years old on Christmas day. Lots older than your great grandfather, so I can't stop the pen wobbling. But I hear that you are getting so good at reading that I expect you will be able to read my letter. I send you lots of love and lots for Michael too. And lots bricks, too, which are called that because there's lots more for you to have next year if you let me know in good time. I think they are prettier and stronger and tidier than pick a bricks. So I hope you will like them. Now I must go. It is a lovely fine night and I've got hundreds of miles to do before morning. There is such a lot to do. A cold kiss from Father Nicholas Christmas. Fun details in this one. He's 1924. So that implies that he was born on the same day as Jesus, because this was Christmas Eve 1923. Also, the clear preference for Lot's Bricks over pick -a bricks I will show Lot's Bricks and pick -a bricks I don't know if I necessarily have a particular opinion, but I assume that John had a particular bias. So, you know, you gotta support your son. Also, the play on words with Lot's and... Lots more for you to have next year. Very cute, very darling. And so the next year, 1924, we get a letter for each of the sons. So the first one reads, Dear Michael Hillary, I am very busy this year. No time for letter. Lots of love. I hope the engine goes well. Take care of it. A big kiss. With love from Father Christmas. So then the letter for John. Dear John, hope you had a happy Christmas. Only time for a short letter. My sleigh is waiting. Lots of new stockings to fill this year. Hope you will like station and things. A big kiss with love from Father Christmas. So apparently the boys were very much into trains for Christmas 1924. With 1925 comes our longest letter yet. It says, my dear boys, I am dreadfully busy this year. It makes my hand much more shaky than ever when I think of it and not very rich. In fact, awful things have been happening and some of the presents have got spoiled and I haven't got the North Polar Bear to help me and I have had to move just before Christmas so you can imagine what a state everything is in. 
and you will see why I have a new address and why I can only write one letter between the two of you. So this is the first mention of the North Polar Bear, and don't you forget him, because he is an incredibly important character in this grand narrative. <laughs> it all happened like this. One very windy day last November, my hood blew off and went and stuck on the top of the North Pole. I told him not to, but the North Polar Bear climbed up to the thin top to get it down, and he did. The pole broke in the middle and fell on the roof of my house, and the North Polar Bear fell through the hole it made into the dining room with my hood over his nose, and all the snow fell off the roof into the house and melted and put out all the fires and ran into the cellars where I was collecting this year's presents, and the North Polar Bear's leg got broken. He is well now but I was so cross with him that he says that he won't try to help me again. I expect his temper is hurt and will be mended by next Christmas. I send you a picture of the accident and of my new house on the cliffs above the North Pole with beautiful cellars in the cliffs. If John can't read my old shaky writing, 1,925 years old, he must get his father to. When is Michael going to learn to read and write his own letters to me? Lots of love to you both and Christopher whose name is rather like mine. That's all. Goodbye. Father Christmas. He keeps mentioning the shaky writing, and I'm sure I've shown some examples of it over here, but I have to assume it is both a stylistic choice and just to disguise his handwriting so that his boys wouldn't recognize it. And then we get a PS from the polar bear. Father Christmas was in a great hurry, told me to put in one of his magic wishing crackers. As you pull, wish, and see if it doesn't come true. Excuse thick writing, I have a fat paw. I help Father Christmas with his packing. I live with him. I am the Great Polar Bear. This is our introduction to the polar bear, along with an adorable little drawing of he himself. His handwriting is gonna change a lot, even if Father Christmas's doesn't. And I do love the double use of the fat paw, where it's the thick writing and the fat paw, but fat is also because he injured it when he broke his leg. Very cute. We also establish Tolkien only writing one letter for both kids, which does continue. And of course, the birth of Christopher, whose name is rather like his, Nicholas Christmas. Monday, December 20th, 1926. My dear boys, I am more shaky than usual this year. The North Polar Bear's fault. It was the biggest bang in the world and the most monstrous firework there has ever been. It turned the North Pole black and shook all the stars out of place, broke the moon into four, and the man in it fell into my back garden. He ate quite a lot of my Christmas chocolates before he said he felt better and climbed back to mend it and get the stars tidy. I love how he makes use of the person setting off fireworks when they shouldn't have, because obviously we see that come back in The Lord of the Rings, even though this was like 20 years before, more than 20? I'm not good at math. His reindeer also broke loose, which is a big problem. And they messed up the sleigh that he had that was filled with chocolate to take to England. So if the kid's chocolate is damaged, then that's not on him. But isn't the North Polar Bear silly? And he isn't a bit sorry. Of course he did it. You remember I had to move last year because of him? The tap for turning on the Rory Bory Alice fireworks is still in the cellar of my old house. The North Polar Bear knew he must never, never touch it. I only let it off on special days like Christmas. He thought it was cut off since we moved. So, Tolkien is providing a mythic explanation for the Rory Borealis, or the Aurora Borealis, which is Father Christmas's fireworks. Anyway, he was nosing around the ruins this morning, soon after breakfast, and turned on all the northern lights for two years in one go. You've never heard or seen anything like it. I have tried to draw a picture of it, but I am too shaky to do it properly. And you can't paint fizzing lights, can you? I think the polar bear has spoilt the picture, rather. Of course he can't draw with those great fat paws. Rude, interjects the polar bear. I can, and write without shaking. And then Father Christmas continues. By going and putting a bit of his own about me chasing the reindeer and him laughing. He did laugh too. So did I when I saw him trying to draw a reindeer and inking his nice white paws. The polar bear continues. Father Christmas had to hurry away and leave me to finish. He is old and gets worried when funny things happen. You would have laughed too. I think it's good of me laughing. It was a lovely firework. The reindeer will run quick to England this year. They are still frightened. I must go help pack. I don't know what Father Christmas would do without me. He always forgets what a lot of packing I do for him. 
The snowman is addressing our envelopes this year. He is Father Christmas's gardener, but we don't get much but snowdrops and frost ferns to grow here. Don't forget the snowman. He's very important. A Merry Christmas to you from North Polar Bear. And love from Father Christmas to you all. So we're really starting to see this kind of mythology shape up with the sudden aurora borealis going off as father christmas's fireworks and the lost reindeer as well as mr snowman who's addressing their envelopes december 21st 1927 my dear people there seem to get more and more of you every year i get poorer and poorer still i hope that i have managed to bring you all something you wanted though not everything you asked for michael and christopher i haven't heard from john this year i suppose he's growing too big and won't even hang up his stockings soon. One of the things we get to do with these letters is watch his children grow up when that first letter was written just for John, and now John's not hanging up his stockings. So the North Polar Bear has spent all of his time sleeping, and when Father Christmas points this out, the Polar Bear protests, saying that everybody sleeps this time of year, including Father Christmas. The North Pole became colder than any cold thing has ever been, and when the North Polar Bear put his nose against it, it took the skin off. Now it is bandaged with red flannel. Why did he? I don't know, but he's always putting his nose where it oughtn't to be. Into my cupboards, for instance. That's because I am hungry. The polar bear interjects. Father Christmas continues. Also, it has been very dark here since winter began. We haven't seen the sun, of course, for three months, but there are no northern lights this year. You remember the awful accident last year? There will be none again until the end of 1928. The North Polar Bear has got his cousin and distant friend, the Great Bear, to shine a little extra bright for us. And this week, I have hired a comet to do my packing by but it doesn't work as well. The North Polar Bear has really not been any more sensible this year. The North Polar Bear protests saying, I have been perfectly sensible and have learned to write with a pen in my mouth instead of a paintbrush. The North Polar Bear is moving up. Yesterday, he was snowballing the snowman, see I said he was gonna come back, in the garden and pushed him over the edge of the cliff so that he fell into my sleigh at the bottom and broke lots of things. One of them, was himself. I used some of what was left of him to paint my white picture. We shall have to make ourselves a new gardener when we are less busy. Okay, so the polar bear killed the snowman, which like, at this point, it's just a snowman. What are you gonna do? But hang on to that fact, because we will come back to that at a later date. The man in the moon paid me a visit the other day, a fortnight ago exactly. He often does about this time, as he gets lonely in the moon, and we make him a nice little plum pudding. He is so fond of things with plums in it. His fingers were cold as usual, and the North Polar Bear made him play Snapdragons to warm them. Snapdragons is a originally Victorian game in which you would get a bowl or plate of raisins and almonds, cover those up in brandy, and then set it on fire. And the game was to try and gobble up as many raisins and almonds as you could by reaching into the fire and putting them into your mouth while they're still on fire. Now, I have read that it doesn't burn you because it's like an alcohol fire, but um, I still desperately want to play this game. Maybe next Christmas you can watch me devour flaming almonds. I don't know. The man in the moon, of course, burnt them, and then he licked them, and then he liked the brandy, and then the bear gave him lots more, and he went fast asleep on the sofa. Then I went down into the cellars to make crackers, and he rolled off the sofa, and then the wicked bear pushed him underneath and forgot all about him. He can never be away a whole night from the moon, but he was this time. The polar bear argues his case, saying that he was nice to the man in the moon, and he looked very comfy under the sofa, which, to be honest, I get that. Suddenly, the snowman, he wasn't broken then, rushed out of the garden next day, just after tea time, and said the moon was going out. The dragons had come out and were making an awful smoke and smother. We rolled him out and shook him and he simply whizzed back, but it was ages before he got things quite cleared up. Now there's a rat on my chair. Sorry if that freaks anybody out. What's funny about this is he mentions that it was a fortnight before this letter came out. And this letter was on December 21st. And a fortnight before that was December 8th through 9th, 1927, which was a lunar eclipse. It must have been that there was a lunar eclipse that Tolkien showed his children, and then he was able to explain it away with his Christmas letter. 
which is just so adorable to me that he's, you know, going out and showing his children what's happening with astronomy. I know. I know I have stuff on my face, but I would like to keep it there. He also explains that the man in the moon had to let one of his terrificalist freezing magics out. The polar bear only laughs when I tell him it's his fault. My messengers told me that you have somebody from Iceland staying with you. That's not so far from where I live and nearly as cold. People don't hang up stockings here, but I usually pass by in a hurry. I'm struggling to figure out who he meant by the somebody from Iceland staying with them, because I know that they had a nanny from Iceland living with them, but that was supposedly in the 1930s, in the early 1930s, and this was 1927? So it would be a little early, but it's also possible that the articles I read about Ada, that was the nanny's name, the articles that I read about Ada said 1930. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. If anybody knows anything more than I do, just please let me know. This must be all, he says. I have written you a very long letter this year, as there was nothing to draw but dark snow and stars. Love to you all, and happiness next year. Your loving Father Christmas. So December 20th, 1928. My dear boys, another Christmas, and I am another year older, and so are you. I feel quite well all the same, very nice of Michael to ask, and not quite so shaky. But that is because we have got all the lighting and heating right again, after the cold, dark year we had in 1927. You remember it? And I expect you remember whose fault it was. What do you think the poor, dear old bear has been and done this time? Nothing as bad as letting off all the lights. Only fell from top to bottom of the main stairs on Thursday. We were beginning to get the first lot of parcels down, out of the storerooms, into the hall. Polar Bear would insist on taking an enormous pile on his head as well as a lot in his arms. The typical, uh, get all the groceries in one go from the car conundrum. Bang, rumble, clatter, crash, awful moanings and growlings. I ran out onto the landing and saw he had fallen from top to bottom on his nose, leaving a trail of balls, bundles, parcels, and things all the way down. And he had fallen on top of some and smashed them. I hope you got none of these by accident. I have drawn you a picture of it all. Polar Bear was rather grumpy at my drawing it. He says my Christmas pictures always make fun of him, and that one year, he will send one drawn by himself of me being idiotic. But of course, I never am. And he can't draw well enough. Yes, I can, said the polar bear. I drew the flag at the end. He joggled my arm and spoiled the little picture at the bottom of the moon laughing and the polar bear shaking his fist at it. When he had picked himself up, he ran out of doors and wouldn't help clear up because I sat on the stairs and laughed as soon as I found out there was not much damage done. That is why the moon smiled. But anyway, I thought you would like a picture of the inside of my new big house for a change. The chief hall is under the largest dome where we pile the presents usually ready to load on the sleighs by the doors. Polar Bear and I built it nearly all ourselves, laid all the blue and mauve tiles. The banisters and roof are not quite straight. Not my fault, says the Polar Bear. Father Christmas did the banisters, but it really doesn't matter. I painted the pictures on the walls of the trees and stars, suns, and moons. Then I said to Polar Bear, I shall leave the freeze, spelled F-R-I-E-Z-E, -E, to you. He said, I should have thought there was enough freeze outside, and your colors inside. All purpley, grayy, bluey, pale, greeny are cold enough too. He's roasting his color scheme. He should know that blues and grays are officially out when it comes to interior design. I said, don't be a silly bear. Do your best. There's a good old polar. And what a result. Icicles all round the hall to make a freeze. F-R-E-E-Z-E. -E. He can't spell very well. And fearful bright colors to make a warm freeze. Polar bear doesn't know the difference between a freeze and a freeze, which... To be honest, I get that. Plus, he's big on bright colors, which I'm a big supporter of. Well, my dears, I hope you will like the things I am bringing, nearly all you asked for, and lots of other little things you didn't, and which I thought of at the last minute. I hope you will share the railway things and farm animals often, and not think they are absolutely for the one whose stocking they were in. Take care of them, for they are some of my very best things. 
So I'm under the impression that the Tolkien children have been having some quarrels over the railway things and farm animals. It's smart of him to uh, have Father Christmas resolve these difficulties. Love to Chris. Love to Michael. Love to John, who must be getting very big, as he doesn't write to me anymore. So I simply had to guess paints. I hope they were all right. Polar Bear chose them. He says he knows what John likes, because John likes bears. Your loving Father Christmas. And my love, Polar Bear. There is something so beautiful about how much knowledge of his children Tolkien displays through these letters. It's just very warm. They're very sweet. November 1929. This is a letter from Polar Bear. Dear boys, my paw is better. I was cutting Christmas trees when I heard it. Do you think my writing is much better too? Father Christmas is very busy already. So am I. We have had heavy snow and some of our messengers got buried and some lost. This is why you have not heard lately. Love to John for his birthday. Father Christmas says my English spelling is not good. I can't help it. We don't speak English here, only Arctic, which you don't know. We also make our letters different. I have made mine like Arctic letters for you to see. And then he writes out goodbye till I see you next and I hope it will be soon in Arctic, which I won't try to pronounce. Polar Bear. My real name is Karu, but I don't tell most people. P.S. I like letters and I think Christopher's are nice. Here is where we really see the character of Polar Bear being solidified with the writing style and the writing itself, as well as the misspelling. And of course, Tolkien couldn't really write anything without inserting at least one invented language into it. As a kid though, this would have been the coolest thing. I loved like runic alphabets and that kind of stuff as a kid, so. Xmas 1929. Dear boys and girl. So Priscilla was born that year in June of 1929. It is like Christmas again, I am glad to say. The Northern Lights have been specially good. There's a lot to tell you. You have heard that the great polar bear chopped his paw when he was cutting Christmas trees. His right one, I mean, not his left. Of course it was wrong to cut it, and a pity too, for he spent a lot of the summer learning to write better so as to help me with my winter letters. We had a bonfire this year to please the polar bear, to celebrate the coming of winter. The snow elves let off all the rockets together, which surprised us both. Again, we have the early release of fireworks as a bit, which he was apparently just so fond of. I tried to draw you a picture of it, but really there were hundreds of rockets. You can't see the elves at all against the snow background. The bonfire made a hole in the ice and woke up the great seal who happened to be underneath. No explanation for that. I hate to overuse this word, the eldritch horror of the great seal, and no further mention. The polar bear let off 20,000 silver sparklers afterwards, used up all my stock, so that is why I had none to send you. That was definitely a matter of, all the stores are out, we can't find our silver sparklers, so have Father Christmas explain it away. Then polar bear went on a holiday to North Norway and stayed with a woodcutter called Olaf and came back with paw all bandaged just at the beginning of our busy times, oh polar bear. So he explains that there are more children than there have ever been before, including children who expect to be looked after, even though they have gone to live in New Zealand or Australia or South Africa or China. How dare they? It's a good thing clocks don't tell the same time all over the world, or else I should never get around. Although when my magic is strongest at Christmas, I can do about a thousand stockings a minute if I have it all planned out beforehand. Planning is key. You could hardly guess the enormous piles of lists I make out. I seldom get them mixed. I think that this version of Father Christmas would be a really big fan of Excel spreadsheets. Just my opinion. But I am rather worried this year. In my office and packing room, the polar bear reads out names while I copy them down. We had awful gales here, worse than you did, tearing clouds of snow to a million tatters, screaming like demons, and burying my house almost up to the roofs. Just at the worst, the North Polar Bear said it was stuffy and opened a north window before I could stop him. You can guess the results. The North Polar Bear was buried in papers and lists, but that did not stop him laughing. Also, my red and green ink was upset, as well as black, so I am writing in chalk and pencil. So presumably, uh, Tolkien had run out of ink. And so, I have some black ink left and the Polar Bear is using it to address parcels. I liked all your letters, very much indeed, my dears. Nobody, or very few, write so much or so nicely to me. I am specially pleased with Christopher's card and his letters. 
and with his learning to write. So I am sending him a fountain pen and also a special picture for himself. It shows me crossing the sea on the upper north wind, while a southwest gale, reindeer hate it, is raising big waves below. This must be all now. I send you all my love. One more stocking to fill this year? That's Priscilla. I hope you will like your new house and the things I bring you. I adore how special he tries to make his kids feel, saying that nobody writes so much or so nicely to him. It's absolutely beautiful. Definitely favoritism on Sir Chris's part, but uh, what are you gonna do? November 28th, 1930, so a little early this year. Father Christmas has got all your letters. What a lot, especially from Christopher and Michael. Thank you, and also Reddy, and your bears, and other animals. Those must be toys and stuffed animals. I am just beginning to get awfully busy. Let me know more about what you specially want. Polar Bear sends love. He's just getting better. He has had whooping cough. Father Nicholas Christmas. So apparently they weren't specific enough. He had to send a special letter. Christmas, 1930. Not finished until Christmas Eve, 24th of December. My dears, I have enjoyed all your letters. I am dreadfully sorry that there's been no time to answer them, and even now, I have not time to finish my picture for you properly, or to send you a full long letter like I mean to. It's a pretty long letter, all things considered. Solid two-pager, but I guess that just shows. I hope you'll like your stockings this year. I tried to find what you asked for, but the stores have been rather in a muddle. You see, the polar bear has been ill. He's had whooping cough, first of all. I could not let him help with the packing and sorting which begins in November because it would be simply awful if any of the children caught polar whooping cough and barked like bears on Boxing Day. So I had to do everything myself in preparation. Of course, Polar Bear has done his best. He cleaned up and mended my sleigh and looked after the reindeer while I was busy. That is how the really bad accident happened. Early this month, we had a most awful snowstorm, nearly six feet of snow, followed by an awful fog. The poor polar bear went out to the reindeer stables and got lost and nearly buried. I did not miss him or go to look for him for a long while. His chest had not got well from whooping cough, so this made him frightfully ill, and he was in bed until three days ago. Everything has gone wrong, and there has been no one to look after my messengers properly. Aren't you glad the polar bear is better? Okay, hang on. We had a party of snow boys, which in parentheses, sons of snowmen, which are the only sort of people that live near. Not, of course, men made of snow, though my gardener, who is the oldest of all snowmen, sometimes draws a picture of a made snowman instead of writing his name, and polar cubs, the polar bear's nephews, on Saturday, as soon as he felt well enough. Okay, so he clarifies that when he says snowmen, he does not mean men made of snow, even the gardener, who, if we will remember in Christmas of 1927, only, th yeah, I guess only three years before this one, Polar Bear pushed Snowman off a cliff, sending him spiraling onto the sleigh, breaking things and himself. The Snowman is not in fact a man made of snow, but an actual guy, meaning that the Polar Bear killed somebody. The North Polar Bear is canonically a murderer. Of course, none of this actually matters, and like, he definitely just like rewrote the lore, which is what he does all the time, but. I'm just saying, Polar Bear needs to pay for his crimes. I've drawn you pictures of everything that happened. Polar Bear telling a story after all the tea things had been cleared away, me finding Polar Bear in the snow, and Polar Bear sitting with his feet in hot mustard and water to stop him shivering. It didn't, and he sneezed so terribly he blew five candles out. Still, he's all right now. I know because he has been at his tricks again, quarreling with the snowman, my gardener, and pushing him through the roof of his snow house so he's still going after the snowman. What does he have against the snowman? Polar Bear is also packing lumps of ice instead of presents in naughty children's parcels. Fun twist on the coal. This might be a good idea, only he never told me. And some of them, with ice, were put in warm storerooms and melted all over good children's presents. Well, my dears, there is lots more I should say about my green brother, and my father, old grandfather Yule, and why we were both called Nicholas after the saint, whose day is December 6th, who used to give secret presents, sometimes throwing purses of money through the window. Just a little lesson in saints in the middle of this Christmas letter. But I must hurry away. I am late already, and I am afraid you may not get this in time. Kisses to you all. Father Nicholas Christmas. 
P.S. Chris has no need to be frightened of me. So apparently in Christmas of 1930, Christopher Tolkien had developed a, a fear of Santa Claus, which, uh, pretty, pretty funny. I love the casual mention of his green brother and his, his, his father, old grandfather Yule. Tolkien really cannot resist creating deeper lore for anything he writes. And it's very funny to me. So this comes from October 31st, 1931. Dear children, already I have got some letters from you. You are getting busy early. I had not begun to think about Christmas yet, dude, same. It has been very warm in the north this year, and there has been very little snow so far. We are just getting our Christmas firewood. This is just to say my messengers will be coming around regularly now winter has begun. We shall be having a bonfire tomorrow, and I shall like to hear from you. Sunday and Wednesday evenings are the best time for you to post me. Keep that in mind, guys. For your letters to Santa this year, Sunday and Wednesday. The polar bear is quite well and fairly good, though you never know what he will do when the Christmas rush begins. Send my love to John. Your loving Father Nicholas Christmas. And the polar bear adds on at the end, glad Father Christmas has waked up. He nearly slept all this hot summer. I wish we could have snow. My coat is quite yellow. Love, polar bear. That is also my end of summer mood. Thanks, polar bear even if you are a murderer. So this is December of the same year, December 23rd, 1931. My dear children, I hope you will like the little things I have sent you. You seem to be most interested in railways just now, so I am sending you mostly things of that sort. I send as much love as ever, in fact, more. We have both, the old polar bear and I, enjoyed having so many nice letters from you and your pets. If you think we have not read them, you are wrong. But if you find that not many of the things you asked for have come, and not perhaps quite as many as sometimes, remember that this Christmas, all over the world, there are a terrible number of poor and starving people. That does feel a little bit like the equivalent of like, there are starving children in Africa who would have loved that food. But this also was like right around the Great Depression, so it would make sense. I, and also my green brother, have had to do some collecting of food and clothes and toys too, for the children whose fathers and mothers and friends cannot give them anything, sometimes not even dinner. I know yours won't forget you. Again, he mentions his green brother. As far as I can determine, it really is just that there is a green version of Santa out there. So I guess, um, choose your fighter. Are you team red Santa or a uh, green Santa? So my dears, I hope you'll be happy this Christmas and not quarrel and we'll have some good games with your railway all together. Don't forget old father Christmas when you light your tree. Nor me, says Polar Bear. It has gone on being warm up here as I told you. Not what you would call warm, but warm for the North Pole with very little snow. The North Polar Bear, if you know who I mean, has been lazy and sleepy as a result and very slow over packing or any job except eating felt that. He has enjoyed sampling and tasting the food parcels this year to see if they were fresh and good, he said. Somebody has to, Polar Bear says. And I found stones in some of the currants, <gasps> but that is not the worst. I should hardly feel it was Christmas if he didn't do something ridiculous. You will never guess what he did this time. I sent him down into one of my cellars, the cracker hole we call it, where I keep thousands of boxes of crackers. He would like to see them, rows upon rows, all with their lids off to show the kind of colors. Well, I wanted 20 boxes and was busy sorting soldiers and farm things, so I sent him. And he was so lazy, he took two snow boys who aren't allowed down there. I mean, truly, who does let a snow boy into their cracker hole? They started pulling crackers out of boxes, and he tried to box them, the boy's ears, I mean, and they dodged and fell over and let his candle fall right poof into my fireworks and crackers and boxes of sparklers. I could hear the noise and smell the smell in the hall, and when I rushed down, I saw nothing but smoke and fizzing stars and old polar bear was rolling over on the floor with sparks sizzling in his coat. He has quite a bear patch burnt onto his back. The snow boys roared with laughter and ran away. Those dastardly snow boys. They said it was a splendid sight, but they won't come to my party on St. Stephen's Day. They have had more than their share already. So that's the first mention of the party on St. Stephen's Day, which does come up. Two of the polar bear's nephews have been staying here for some time. 
Paksu and Volkotuka. Fat and white hair, they say it means. Those are Finnish names, by the way. They are fat-tummied polar cubs and are very funny boxing one another and rolling about. But another time, I shall have them on Boxing Day and not just at packing time. I fell over them 14 times a day last week, and Valkotuka swallowed a ball of red string thinking it was cake, and he got it all wound up inside and had a tangled cough. He couldn't sleep at night, but I thought it rather served him for putting holly in my bed. It was the same cub that poured all the black ink yesterday into the fire to make night. It did, and a very smelly, smoky one. We lost Paksu all last Wednesday and found him on Thursday morning asleep in a cupboard in the kitchen. He had eaten two whole puddings raw. They seem to be growing up just like their uncle. Not fair, polar bear interjects. Goodbye now. I shall soon be off on my travels once more. You need not believe any pictures you see of me in airplanes or motors. I cannot drive one and do not want to. And they are too slow anyway, not to mention the smell. They cannot compare with my own reindeer, which I train myself. Tokin cannot let his distaste for technology um, not be on display, which fair enough, yeah. They cannot compare with my own reindeer, which I train myself. They are all very well this year, and I expect my post will be in good time. I have got some new young ones this year from Lapland. A great place for wizards, but these are wizards. The, the polar bear comments bad on that pun, which is fair. Lapland is up near the Arctic Circle, if I'm not mistaken, and traditionally yeah, is the homeland of wizards and the like. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's the case, so. It's a great place for wizards, but these reindeer are wizards. One day I will send you a picture of my dear stables and harness houses. I am expecting that John, although he is now over 14, will hang up his stockings this last time. But I don't forget people, even when they are past stocking age. Not until they forget me. So I send love to all, and especially little PM, Priscilla, who is beginning her stocking days. And I hope that they will be happy. Your loving Father Christmas. P.S. This is all drawn by North Polar Bear. Don't you think he's getting better? But the green ink is mine. And he didn't ask for it. Some beautiful art from Polar Bear. November 30th, 1932. A little early this year. Thank you for your nice letters. I have not forgotten you. I am very late this year and very worried. A funny thing has happened. The polar bear has disappeared and I don't know where he is. I have not seen him since the beginning of this month and I am getting anxious. Tomorrow, December, the Christmas month begins and I don't know what I shall do without him. I am glad you are all very well and your many pets. The snow baby's holiday begins tomorrow. Are snow babies just baby snow boys? Is that how that works? I wish polar bear was here to look after them. Love to Michael, Christopher, and Priscilla. Please send John my love when you write to him. Father and Christmas. Christmas of the same year. And this is a big one, guys. December 23rd, 1932. My dear children, there is a lot to tell you. First of all, a Merry Christmas. But there have been lots of adventures you will want to hear about. It all began with the funny noise underground, which started in the summer and got worse and worse. I was afraid an earthquake might happen. The North Polar Bear says he suspected what was wrong from the beginning. I only wish he had said something to me. And anyway, it can't be quite true as he was fast asleep when it began and did not wake up till about Michael's birthday, which I believe is like September, July, I don't remember. However, he went off for a walk one day at the end of November, I think, and he never came back. About a fortnight ago, I began to be really worried for after all, the dear old thing is really a lot of help in spite of accidents and very amusing. On Friday evening, December 9th, there was a bumping at the front door and a snuffling. I thought he had come back and lost his key as often before, same. But when I opened the door, there was another very old bear there and a fat and funny shaped one. Actually, it was the eldest of the few remaining cave bears, old Mr. Cave Bear himself. I had not seen him for centuries. Mr. Cave Bear explains that Polar Bear has gotten lost in the caves where Cave Bear lives, but then once he had fallen inside the caves, he smelled goblin. So he went off deeper into the goblin caves. So then the goblins shut off all their lights and made queer noises and false echoes. Goblins are to us very much what rats are to you. Only worse because they are very clever and only better because in these parts, very few. I'm offended 
for you guys, and I'm sorry you had to hear that, quite frankly. They're very clever. Mine aren't, but some rats are very clever, Mr. Tolkien. Cave Bear found Polar Bear and tried to lead him out, but then the goblins were able to imitate Cave Bear's voice and lead Polar Bear off trail. Light is what we need, said Cave Bear to me, Father Christmas. So I got some of my special sparkling torches, which I sometimes use in my deepest cellars, and we set off that night. The caves are wonderful. I knew they were there, but not how many or how big they were. Of course, the goblins went off into the deepest holes and corners, and we soon found Polar Bear. He was getting quite long and thin with hunger, as he had been in the caves about a fortnight. Polar Bear himself was astonished when I brought light, for the most remarkable thing is that the walls of the caves are all covered with pictures, cut into the rock or painted in red and brown and black. Some of them are very good, mostly of animals, and some are queer and some bad, and there are many strange marks, signs, and scribbles, some of which have a nasty look, and I'm sure have something to do with black magic. Cave Bear explains that he and his ancestors have been living in this cave for a great long while, and that they were the ones who first started making art on the cave walls to sharpen their claws. Then men came along, and these men imitated the art of the cave bears on the walls. The goblin pictures must be very old, because the goblin fighters are sitting on drasils, a very queer sort of dwarf dachshund horse creature they used to use, but they have died out long ago. I believe the red gnomes finished them off somewhere about Edward IV's time. Again, throwing in lore in his Christmas letters. So there are rhinoceroses and mammoths and ox and stags and bears. Father Christmas drew out as many of the cave paintings as he possibly could. Next comes a picture of me and Cave Bear and North Polar Bear exploring the caves. I will tell you more about that in a minute because we haven't heard enough about that. The last picture hasn't happened yet. It soon will. On Stephen's day when the rush is over, I am going to have a rowdy party the cave bear's grandchildren, they are exactly like live teddy bears, snow babies, and some of the children of red gnomes, and of course, polar cubs, including Paksu and Valkotuka, will be there. I'm wearing a pair of new green trousers. They were a present from my green brother, but I only wear them at home. Does the green brother only give people green gifts? Goblins anyway dislike green, he clarifies, so I found them useful. Okay, we're starting to build the lore of the green brother. Maybe he's like a goblin hunter who also gives kids gifts. I like this idea. I'd see this movie. You see, when I rescued Polar Bear, we hadn't quite finished the adventures. At the beginning of last week, we went into the cellars to get up the stuff for England. I said to Polar Bear, somebody has been disarranging things here. Paksu and Valkotuka, I expect, he said, but it wasn't. Next day, things were much worse, especially amongst the railway things, lots of which seemed to be missing. I ought to have guessed, and Polar Bear ought to have mentioned his guess to me. Last Saturday, we went down and found nearly everything had disappeared out of the main cellar. Imagine my state of mind. Nothing hardly to send to anybody, and too little time to get or make new stuff. North Polar Bear said, I smell goblins strong. Of course, it was obvious. They love mechanical toys, though they quickly smash them and want more and more and more. And practically all the Hornby things had gone. Eventually we found a large hole, but not big enough for us, leading to a tunnel behind some packing cases in the west cellar. Those nasty little goblins. So they find a cave, and it indicates that the goblins have been stealing things for many, many years for a little while. Ever since I moved, they must have been burrowing all the way to my cliff, boring, banging, and blasting as quietly as they could. At last, they had reached my new cellars, and the sight of the hornby things was too much for them. They took all they could. I dare say they were also still angry with the polar bear. Also, they thought we couldn't get at them. But I sent my patent green luminous smoke down the tunnel, and polar bear blew and blew it with our enormous kitchen bellows. They simply shrieked and rushed out the other cave end. So because they hate green, they were able to just smoke them out with green smoke. But there were red gnomes there. I had specially sent for them. A few of the real old families are still in Norway. They captured hundreds of goblins and chased many more out into the snow, which they hate. We made them show us where they had hidden things or bring them all back again. And by Monday, we had practically everything back. The gnomes are still dealing with the goblins and promise there won't be one left by New Year, but I am not so sure. They will crop up again in a century or so, I 
expect. We've had a rush, but dear old Cave Bear and his sons and the gnome ladies helped, so that we are now very well forward and all packed. I hope there is not the faintest smell of goblin about any of your things. They have all been well aired. There are still a few railway things missing, but I hope you will have what you want. I am not able to carry quite as much toy cargo as usual this year, as I am taking a good deal of food and clothes. Useful stuff. There are far too many people in your land, and others who are hungry and cold this winter. I am glad that with you the weather is warmish. It is not warm here. We have had tremendous icy winds and terrific snowstorms, and my old house is quite buried. But I am feeling very well, better than ever. And though my hand wobbles with a pen, partly because I don't like writing as much as drawing, I don't think it's so wobbly this year. I must say, the, the wobbly handwriting does warm my heart. My great-grandmother was the first person that kind of made me realize that people get old, and one of the things that first started to go was her handwriting. And so for holidays and birthdays, she would always send each of her great-grandchildren a card with five dollars in it, and she would always sign it off. And I, I remember her handwriting would just get wobblier and, and wobblier as she got older, and eventually she, she stopped being able to write it at all. But I still loved seeing her handwriting in those cards every year. This is one of my very longest letters. It has been an exciting time. I hope you will all like hearing about it. I send you all my love. John, Michael, Christopher, and Priscilla. Also, Mummy and Daddy and Auntie, and all the people in your house. I dare say John will feel he has got to give up stockings now and give way to many new children that have arrived since he first began to hang his up. But Father Christmas will not forget him. Bless you all. Your loving Father Nicholas Christmas. December 2nd, 1993. Dear people, very cold here at last. Business has really begun and we are working hard. I have had many good letters from you. I have made notes of what you want so far, but I expect I shall hear more from you yet. I am rather short of messengers, but I haven't had time to tell you about our excitements now. I hope I shall find time to send a letter later. Give John my love when you see him. I send love to all of you and a kiss for Priscilla. Tell her my beard is quite nice and soft, as I had never shaved. Three weeks to Christmas Eve. Yours, Father Nicholas Christmas. Apparently Priscilla had some concerns about Father Christmas's beard care, which I do get. Cheer up, chaps, says the polar bear. Also, chaplet, if that's the feminine. <laughs> the fun's beginning. Yours, polar bear. December 21st, 1933. My dears, another Christmas. I almost thought at one time, in November, that there would not be one this year. There will be the 25th of December, of course, but nothing from your old great great etc. grandfather at the North Pole. Goblins. The worst attack we've had for centuries. They have been fearfully wild and angry since we took all their stolen toys off them last year and doused them with green smoke. I would be too. I'd also be upset if I was doused in green smoke. You remember the Red Gnomes promised to clear them all out. There was not one to be found in any hole or cave by New Year's Day. But I said they would crop up again. In a century or so. They have not waited so long. They must have gathered up their nasty friends from mountains all over the world and have been busy all summer while we were at our sleepiest. This time, we had very little warning. Soon after All Saints Day, Polar Bear got very restless. He says now he smelt nasty smells. But as usual, he did not say anything. He says he did not want to trouble me. He really is a nice old thing. And this time, he absolutely saved Christmas. He took to sleeping in the kitchen with his nose towards the cellar door, opening onto the main stairway down into my big stores. One night, just about Christopher's birthday, which was November 21st, I woke up suddenly. There was squeaking and spluttering in the room and a nasty smell. I caught sight of a wicked little face at the window. I was only just quite awake when a terrific din began far downstairs in the store cellars. It would take too long to describe, so I have tried to draw a picture of what I saw when I got down there, after treading on a goblin on the mat. So the polar bear complains about the picture, saying only there were more like a thousand goblins rather than fifteen. But you could hardly expect me to draw a thousand, Father Christmas replies. Polar bear was squeezing, squashing, trampling, boxing, and kicking goblins sky high and roaring like a zoo, and the goblins were yelling like engine whistles. He was splendid. Say no more, says polar bear. I enjoyed it immensely. Well, it is a long story. 
The trouble lasted for over a fortnight, and it began to look as if I should never be able to get my sleigh out again this year. The goblins had set part of the stones on fire, and captured several gnomes who sleep down there on guard, before Polar Bear and some more gnomes came in and killed a hundred before I arrived. Polar Bear is bringing back out his murderous tendencies, I see. Even when we had put the fire out and cleared the cellars and the house, I can't think what they were doing in my room unless they were trying to set fire to my bed. I had to blow my golden trumpet, which I have not done for many years, to summon all my friends. There were several battles. Every night they used to attack and set fire in the stores before we got the upper hand, and I'm afraid quite a lot of my dear elves got hurt. Fortunately, we have not lost much except my best string and packing papers and holly boxes. I am very short on these and have been very short on messengers. Lots of my people are still away chasing the goblins out of my land, those that are left alive. I do wonder if maybe they forgot to buy wrapping paper or something this year, and so this is the excuse for it? Polar Bear certainly has been busy helping, and double help, but he has mixed up some of the girls' things with the boys' things in his hurry. We hope we have got all sorted out, but if you hear of anyone getting a doll when they wanted an engine, you will know why. Actually, Polar Bear tells me I'm wrong. We did lose a lot of railway stuff, goblins always go for that, and what we got back was damaged and will have to be repainted. It will be a busy summer next year. Now a Merry Christmas to you all once again. I hope you all have a very happy time and will find that I have taken notice of your letters and sent you what you wanted. I don't think my pictures were very good this year, though I took quite a time over them, at least two minutes. Polar Bear says, I don't see that a lot of stars and pictures of goblins in your bedroom are so frightfully merry. Still, I hope you won't mind. It is rather good of Polar Bear kicking, really. He's right though, that is an amazing picture. The power, the might, the bear. Still, I hope you won't mind. Anyway, I send lots of love. Yours ever and annually. Father Nicholas Christmas. So this is from 1934. My dear Christopher, thank you. I am awake and have been a long while, but my post office does not ever really open until Michael Mass. Michael Mass, of course, being presumably Michael's birthday, which was October 22nd. I shall not be sending my messengers out regularly this year until about October 15th. There is a good deal to do up here. Your telegram, that is why I have sent an express reply, and letter and Priscilla's were found quite by accident. Not by a messenger, but by Bellman. I don't know how he got that name, because he never rings any. Very much love to you and Priscilla. The polar bear, if you remember him, is still fast asleep and quite thin after so much fasting. He will soon cure that. I shall tickle his ribs and wake him up soon, and then he will eat several months' breakfast, all in one. More love, your loving father Christmas. So apparently, Christopher and Priscilla had urgent messages to send to Father Christmas in early October. I don't know what you would so frantically need to tell Father Christmas, but we may never know. Just checking in, I suppose. But also, apparently the polar bear like reverse hibernates, where he sleeps through the entire summer and then eats several months worth of food when winter comes, which I think is pretty funny. So it's Christmas Eve 1934. My dear Christopher, thank you very much for your many letters. I have not had time this year to write you so long a letter as 1932 and 1933, but nothing at all exciting has happened. I hope I have pleased you with the things I am bringing and that they are near enough to your lists. Very little news. After the frightful business of last year, there has not been even a smell of goblin for 200 miles around. I wonder if they were so desperate to send Father Christmas a letter because they were worried about him after all the goblin news from the previous two years. They wanted to uh, check in on him and make sure there wasn't any other goblin mischief. But as I said it would, it took us far into the summer to repair all the damage and we lost a lot of sleep and rest. When November came around, we did not feel like getting to work and we were rather slow and so have been rushed at the end. Ain't that just the way the holiday season goes, though? Cheers. Also, it has been unusually warm for the North Pole, and the polar bear still keeps on yawning. Paksu and Valkotuka have been here a long while. They have grown a good deal, but still get up to frightful mischief in between times of trying to help. This year, they stole my paints and painted scrawls on the white walls of the cellar, ate all the mincemeat out of the pies made ready for Christmas, and only yesterday went and unpacked half of the parcels to find railway things to play with. Of course he would make the cute cubs that presumably his kids loved also like railway toys. 
they don't get on well with the cave cubs somehow. Several of these have arrived today and are staying here a few nights with old Cave Brown Cave, who is their uncle, granduncle, grandfather, great granduncle, etc. Paksu is always kicking them because they squeak and grunt so funnily. <laughs> Polar Bear has to box him often, and a box from Polar Bear is no joke. Yeah, he's a convicted murderer, or at least he should be. As there are no goblins about, and as there is no wind, and so far much less snow than usual, we are going to have a great Boxing Day party ourselves, out of doors. I shall ask a hundred elves and red gnomes, lots of polar cubs, cave cubs, and snow babies, and of course, Paksu and Valkotuka, and Polar Bear, and Cave Bear, and his nephews will be there. We have brought a tree all the way from Norway and planted it in a pool of ice. My picture gives you no idea of its size or of the loveliness of its magic lights of different colors. We tried them yesterday evening to see if they were all right. If you see a bright glow in the north, you will know what it is. Behind the tree are snow plants and piled masses of snow made into ornamental shapes. They are purple and black because of darkness and shadow. There's also a special edging to the ice pool, and it's made of real colored icing. Paksu and Valkotuka are already nibbling at it, though they should not till the party. Polar Bear started to draw this to help me as I was busy, but he dropped such blots, enormous ones. I had to come to the rescue. Not very good this year. Never mind. Perhaps better next year. I hope you will like your presents and be happy. Your loving Father Christmas. P.S. I can't really remember in exactly what year I was born. I doubt if anyone knows. I am always changing my own mind about it. Anyway, it was 1,934 years ago or jolly near that. Bless you, FC. PPS. Give my love to Mick and John. And then a note from Polar Bear. Love, busy, thanks. So it seems that Michael as well has stopped putting out his stocking and writing letters, which is a shame. You know. Also, I just love how he's roasting his own drawing skills. It's very much like every artist I've ever known. December 24th, 1935. My dear children, here we are again. Christmas seems to come around pretty soon again. Always much the same and always different. No ink this year and no water. So no painted pictures. Also very cold hands, so very wobbly writing. A rat is currently grooming my fingers, so that's why I'm reaching out like this. Last year it was very warm, but this year it is frightfully cold. Snow, 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 and ice. We have been simply buried. Messengers have got lost and found themselves in Nova Scotia, if you know where that is, instead of Scotland. And Polar Bear, if you know who that is, could not get home. I wonder if the Polar Bear, if you know who that is, because they've done that once or twice before, I wonder if that's like a, a bit in the family or something, because... Obviously, we know who Polar Bear is at this point. At, like, how could we not? Hi, peepers. This is a picture of my house about a week ago, before we got the reindeer sheds dug out. We had to make a tunnel to the front door. See, this is a good example. Paragraph or two later. Poor old PB, if you know who I mean, had to go away soon after the snow began last month. There were some troubles with his family, and Paksu and Valkutuka were very ill. He is very good at doctoring anybody but himself. I love the little drawing he has of Polar Bear with his little doctor's kit or suitcase labeled PB. Amazing. But it is a dreadfully long way over the ice and snow to North Greenland, I believe. And when he got there, he could not get back. So I've been rather held up, especially as the reindeer stables and the outdoor store sheds are snowed over. I have had a lot of red elves to help me. They are very nice and great fun, but although they are very quick, they don't get on fast. For they turn everything into a game, even digging snow, and they will play with the toys they are supposed to be packing. PB, if you remember him, did not get back until Friday, December 13th. Oh, so that proved a lucky day for me after all. Even he had to wear a sheepskin coat and red gloves for his paws. And he had got a hood on and red gloves. He thinks he looks rather like Rye St. Anthony. But of course, he does not very much. Rye St. Anthony, there's two possible things this could be. There's a Catholic church in East Sussex in Rye that was established in 1927. So it would have been around. And it was a Catholic church, which, you know, Tolkien was Catholic. So, But there also is an all-girls school in Oxford that was established in 1930. So again, it would have been around. But that's, I believe, Rye St. Anthony without the H. And their uniforms have red in them, I believe. I feel like it's 
probably that one, but then the Anthony Antony thing confuses me, so. Um, anyway, Polar Bear carries his things in his hood. He brought his soap and sponge home in it. He says that we have not seen the last of the goblins, in spite of the battles in 1933. They won't dare come into my land yet, but for some reason they are breeding again and multiplying all over the world. Quite a nasty outbreak. But there are not so many in England, he says. I expect I shall have trouble again with them soon. I have given my elves some new magic sparkler spears that will scare them out of their wits. It is now December 24th, and they have not appeared this year, and practically everything is packed up and ready. I shall be starting soon. I send you all, John and Michael and Christopher and Priscilla, my love and good wishes this Christmas. Tons of good wishes. Pass on a few if you don't want them all. Polar Bear, in case you don't know who PB is, sends love to you all, and to the Bingos, and to Orange Teddy, and to Jubilee. Oh yes, I learn lots of news, even in snowy weather. Bingos are a type of teddy bear that I believe Priscilla owned, and Orange Teddy and Jubilee must have been other stuffed animals of theirs. My messengers will be about until the new year if you want to write and tell me everything was alright. I hope you enjoy the pantomime. They must have been going to see a pantomime, which is delightful. Your loving Father Christmas. P.S. Foxu and Volko Tuka are well again. Only mumps. They will be at my big party on St. Stephen's Day with the other polar cubs, cave cubs, snow babies, elves, and all the rest. Again, one of my favorite things is just how special he makes the kids out to be, where it's like asking them if they're going to enjoy the pantomime that they're going to see and talking about their stuffed animals. It is just so kind. This is December 23rd, 1936. My dear children, I am sorry I cannot send you a long letter to thank you for yours, but I am sending a picture which will explain a good deal. It is a good thing your changed lists arrived before these awful events, or I could not have done anything about it. I do hope you will like what I am bringing and will forgive any mistakes and I hope nothing will still be wet. I am still so shaky and upset. I am getting one of my elves to write a bit more about things. I send very much love to you all. An elf is now writing this next part. The elves have moved in with Father Christmas in order to help him get his work done, and they're running very efficiently. Polar Bear is quite knackered after they get all of the gifts packed up early by December 19th, and he goes upstairs to take a bath and go to bed early. Father Christmas was taking a last look around the English delivery room about 10 o'clock when water poured through the ceiling and swamped everything. It was soon six inches deep on the floor. Polar Bear had simply got into the bath with both taps running and had gone fast asleep with one hind paw on the overflow. He had been asleep two hours when we woke him. Father Christmas was really angry, but Polar Bear only said, I did have a jolly dream. I dreamt I was diving off a melting iceberg and chasing the seals. He said later when he saw the damage, Well, there is one thing. Those children at North Pole Road, Oxford, I believe is the Tolkien children, may lose some of their presents, but they will have a letter worth hearing this year. They can see a joke, even if none of you can. That made Father Christmas angrier, and Polar Bear said, Well, draw a picture of it and ask them if it's funny or not. So Father Christmas has. But he has begun to think it's funny, although very annoying, himself. So we have cleared up the mess and got the English presents repacked again, just in time. We are all rather tired, so please excuse scrawly writing. Yours, Ilbereth, secretary to Father Christmas. So, I wonder if Ilbereth turned into Elbereth, as we would see in The Silmarillion and Lord of the Rings. Just a thought. Polar Bear adds on to the end, very sorry, been busy, can't find that alphabet. We'll look after Christmas and post it. Polar Bear later sends a letter saying, I have found it. I send you a copy. You needn't fill in the black parts if you don't want to. It takes rather long to write, but I think it is rather clever. So explaining how to write in the goblin system. Still busy. Father Christmas says I can't have a bath until next year. Love to you both, because you see jokes. Polar bear. I got into hot water, didn't I? Haha. <laughs> what a little punster. This is Christmas of 1937, which was the year of the Hobbit's publication. Tolkien was sick this Christmas. Uh, on December 16th, he wrote to his publisher calling himself half alive. He says, My dear Christopher and Priscilla, and other old friends in Oxford, here we are again. Of course, I am always here when not traveling, but you know what I mean. Christmas again. I believe it is 17 years since I started writing to you. I wonder if you have still got all my letters. 
I have not been able to keep quite all of yours, but I have got some from every year. The implication that they sent Father Christmas multiple letters every Christmas, like even from like just one kid, that makes me really happy. They had their little pen pal. We had quite a fright this year. No letters came from you. Then one day in early December, I sent a messenger who used to go to Oxford a lot, but has not been there in quite a long while. And he said, their house is empty and everything is sold. I was afraid something had happened, or that you had all gone to school in some other town and your father and mother had moved. Of course, I know now that the messenger had been to your old house next door. He complained that all the windows were shut and the chimneys all blocked up. Apparently that year the Tolkien's moved. I was very glad indeed to get Priscilla's first letter and your two nice letters and useful lists and hints since Christopher came back. I quite understand that school makes it difficult for you to write like you used. And of course, I have new children coming on my list every year so that I don't get less busy. Tell your father I am sorry about his eyes and throat. I once had my eyes very bad from snow blindness, which comes from looking at sunlit snow, but it got better. I hope Priscilla and your mother and everyone else will be well on December 25th. I am afraid I have not had any time to draw you a picture this year. You see, I strained my hand moving heavy boxes in the cellars in November and could not start my letters until later than usual, and my hand still gets tired quickly. But Ilbereth, one of the cleverest elves who I took on as secretary not long ago, is becoming very good. He can write several alphabets now. Arctic, Latin, that is ordinary European like you use. Of course you would call normal English Latin. He's such a nerd. Greek, Russian, runes, and of course, elvish. His writing is a bit thin and slanting. He has a very slender hand. And his drawing is a bit scratchy, I think. He won't use paints. He says he is a secretary and so only uses ink. He is going to finish this letter for me as I have to do some others. So I will now send you lots of love and I do hope that I have chosen the best things out of your suggestion list. I was going to send hobbits, the hobbit. I am sending away loads, mostly second editions, which I have sent for only a few days ago. But I thought you would already have lots. So I am sending another Oxford fairy story. Lots and lots of love, Father Christmas. This is the part of the letter from Ilbereth. Dear children, I am Ilbereth. I have written to you before. I am finishing for Father Christmas. Shall I tell you about my pictures? Polar Bear and Valkutuka and Paksu are always lazy after Christmas. Or rather, after the St. Stephen's Day party, which was December 26th, I believe. Father Christmas is ringing for breakfast in vain. Another day when Polar Bear, as usual, was late. Not true, Polar Bear interjects. Paksu threw a sponge bath full of icy water on his face, and Polar Bear chased him all round the house and round the garden and then forgave him because he had not caught Paksu, but he had found an appetite. We had terrible weather at the end of the winter and actually had rain. We could not go out for days. I have drawn Polar Bear and his nephews when they did venture out. Paksu and Valkutuka have never gone away. They like it so much that they have begged to stay. It was much too warm at the North Pole this year. A large lake formed at the bottom of the cliff and left the North Pole standing on an island. I have drawn a view looking south, so the cliff is on the other side. It was about midsummer. The North Polar Bear, his nephews, and lots of polar cubs used to come and bathe. Also seals. We had a glorious bonfire and fireworks to celebrate the coming of winter and the beginning of real preparations. The snow came down very thick in November, and the elves and snow boys had several tobogganing half-holidays. The polar cubs were not very good at it. They fell off, and most of them took to rolling or sliding down just on themselves. Today, but this is the best bit, I had just finished my picture, or I might have drawn it differently. And better, Polar Bear says. Polar Bear was being allowed to decorate a big tree in the garden all by himself and a ladder. Suddenly, I heard terrible growling, squealy noises. We rushed out to find Polar Bear hanging on the tree himself. You are not a decoration, said Father Christmas. Anyway, I am a light, he shouted. He was. We threw a bucket of water all over him, which spoiled a lot of the decorations, but saved his fur. The old silly thing had rested a ladder against the branch instead of against the trunk of the tree. Then he thought, I will just light the candles to see if they are working, although he was told not to. So he climbed to the tip of the ladder with a taper, 
just then the branch cracked, the ladder slipped on the snow and mud, and Polar Bear fell into the tree and caught on some wire, and his fur got caught on fire. Can I just say that I'm so glad that we don't use candles on Christmas trees anymore? That just seems like a, a recipe for disaster. Luckily, he was rather damp or he might have fizzled. I wonder if roast polar is good to eat. Polar Bear says, not as good as well spanked and fried elf. The last picture is imaginary and not very good, but I hope it will come true. It will if Polar Bear behaves. I hope you can read my writing. I try to write like dear old Father Christmas without the trembles, but I cannot do so well. I can write Elvish better. And then there's a line of Elvish script, of course. That is some, but Father Christmas says that I write too spidery and that you would never read it. Love, Ilbereth. A big hug and lots of love, Polar Bear adds. Enormous thanks for letters. I don't get many, though I work so hard. I am practicing new writing with lovely thick pen, quicker than Arctic. I invented it. Ilbreth is cheeky. How are the bingos? The teddy bears. A Merry Christmas. North Polar Bear. Christmas 1938. My dear Priscilla and all others at your house. So I believe this is at a point when it is mostly Priscilla who's writing and not anybody else. Here we are again. Bless me. I believe I've said that before, but after all, you don't want Christmas to be different each year, do you? I am frightfully sorry that I haven't had time to draw any big picture this year, and Ilbereth, my secretary, has not done one either, but we are all sending you some rhymes instead. Some of my other children seem to like rhymes, so perhaps you will. We have all been very sorry to hear about Christopher. I hope he is better and will have a jolly Christmas. I only heard lately when my messengers and letter collectors came back from Oxford. Tell him to cheer up. And although he is now growing up and leaving stockings behind, I shall bring a few things along this year. Among them is a small astronomy book, which gives a few hints on the use of telescopes. Thank you for telling me he has got one. Dear me, my hand is shaky. I hope you can read some of this. I loved your long letter with all the amusing pictures. Give my love to your bingos and all the other 60 or more, especially Raggles and Predley and Tinker and Taylor and Jubilee and Snowball. I hope you will go on writing to me for a long while yet. Very much love to you and lots for Chris from Father Christmas. Here we are um, for the rhymes. I'm going to do what I can, but just know some of these rhymes may not sound great and it's not my fault. Again this year, my dear Priscilla, when you're asleep upon your pillow. Bad rhyme. That's beaten you, says Polar Bear. Beside your bed, old Father Christmas. And then this is an introduction. The English language has no rhyme to Father Christmas. That's why I'm not very good at making verses. But what I find a good deal worse is that girls and boys' names won't rhyme either. And bother, either won't rhyme neither. So please forgive me, dear Priscilla if I pretend you rhyme with Pilla. She won't, says Polar Bear. As I was saying, beside your bed, old Father Christmas, afraid that any creak or hiss must wake you up, will in a twinkling fill up your stocking. I've an inkling that it belongs in fact to Pater, but never mind, at twelve or later he will arrive and hopes once more that he has chosen from his store the things you want. You're half past nine, but still I hope you'll drop a line for some years yet and won't forget that old Father Christmas and his pet, the North Polar Bear and Polar Cubs as fat as little butter tubs and snow boys and elves, in fact the whole of my household up near the pole. Upon my list made in December, your number is, if you remember, 56,785, it can't be wondered, at that I am so busy when you think that you are nearly 10, and in that time my list has grown by quite 10,000 girls alone. You all will wonder what's the news, if all has gone well, and if not who's to blame, and whether Polar Bear has earned a mark, good, bad, or fair, for his behavior since last winter. Well, first he trod upon a splinter. Just rhyming nonsense, says Polar Bear. It was a nail, rusty too, and went on crutches in November. And then one cold day in December, he burnt his nose and singed his paws upon the kitchen grate because, without the help of tongs, he tried to roast hot chestnuts. Wow, he cried. I never did, 
says Polar Bear, and used a pound of butter best to cure the burns. Don't use butter on burns. That's something that they taught me in college. I mean, I knew it before, but that is something I distinctly remember learning in college. Do not put butter on burns. That's all. He would not rest, but on the 23rd he went and climbed up on the roof. He meant to clear the snow away that choked his chimney up. Of course he poked his legs right through the tiles in snow in tons fell on his bed below. He has broken saucers, cups, and plates, and eaten lots of chocolates. He's dropped large boxes on my toes and trodden tin soldiers flat in rows. He's overwound engines and broken springs and mixed up different children's things. He's thumbed new books and burst balloons and scribbled lots of smudgy runes on my best paper and wiped his feet on scarves and hankies folded neat. And yet he has been, on the whole, a very kind and willing soul. He's fetched and carried, counted, packed, and for a week has never slacked. He's climbed the cellar stairs at least 5,000 times, the dear old beast. Paksu sends love and Valko Tuka. They are still with me and they don't look a year older, but they are just a bit more wise and have a pinch more wit. The goblins, you'll be glad to hear, have not been seen at all this year, not near the pole, but I am told they're moving south and getting bold, and coming back to many lands and making with their wicked hands new mines and caves, but do not fear, they'll hide away when I appear. So this is a part from Ilbereth. Christmas Day. Now Christmas Day has come around again, and poor North Polar Bear has got a bad pain. They say he swallowed a couple of pounds of nuts without cracking the shells, it sounds a polarish sort of thing to do, but that isn't all between me and you. He has eaten a ton of various goods and recklessly mixed all his favorite foods, honey with ham and turkey with treacle and pickles with milk. I think that a week'll be needed to put the old bear on his feet and mustn't forget his particular treat. Plum pudding with sausages and Turkish delight, covered with cream and devoured at a bite. And after this dish, he stood on his head. It's rather a wonder the poor fellow's not dead. Polar bear gets his turn. Absolute rot. I have not got a pain in my pot. I do not eat turkey or meat. I stick to the sweet, which is why, as all know, I am so sweet myself, you thinuous elf. Goodbye. Ilbereth corrects him, saying he means fatuous. And Polar Bear says, no, I don't. You're not fat, but thin and silly. Then it's back to Father Christmas. You know my friends too well to think, although they're rather rude with ink, that there are really quarrels here. We've had a very jolly year, except for Polar Bear's rusty nail. But now this rhyme must catch the mail. A special messenger must go in spite of thickly falling snow, or else this won't get down to you on Christmas Day, it's half past two. We've quite a ton of crackers still to pull and glasses still to fill. Our love to you on this Noel. And till the next one, fare you well. Father Christmas, Polar Bear, Ilbereth, and Paksu and Valkotuka. I wonder if Paksu and Valkotuka were particularly favorites of Priscilla, because We've never had a sign-off from them until it's a letter just to her. And I know she does love her stuffed animals, especially her stuffed bears, so it's possible. I'm also fascinated by the fact that he was like, I don't have enough time to do a letter, so I will write an entire, like, three-page poem. I mean, I can't really draw or write poetry, so um, he's ahead of me on both of those fronts. I'm just astonished that the letter was easier. This next one is from 1939, and this is the year that World War II began in September. So it would still be very fresh on everyone's minds, including Priscilla. December 24th, 1939. My dear Priscilla, I'm glad you managed to send me two letters, although you have been rather busy working. I hope your bingo family will have a jolly Christmas and behave themselves. Tell Billy, is that not the father's name? To not be so cross. They are not to quarrel over the crackers I am sending. I am very busy, and things are very difficult this year, owing to this horrible war. Many of my messengers have never come back. I haven't been able to do a very nice picture this year. 
It's supposed to show me carrying things down to our new path to the sleigh sheds. Paksu is in front with a torch, looking most frightfully pleased with himself, as usual. There's just a glimpse, quite enough, of Polar Bear strolling along behind. He is, of course, carrying nothing. There have been no adventures here, and nothing funny has happened. And that is because Polar Bear has hardly done anything to help this year, as he so calls it. Rot, says Polar Bear. I don't think he has been lazier than usual, but he has not been at all well. He ate some fish that disagreed with him last November and was afraid he might have to go to hospital in Greenland. But after living only on warm water for a fortnight, he suddenly threw the glass and jug out the window and decided to get better. That's also how I deal with sickness. You let yourself be sick for a while, and then you decide that it's time to be done, and then you stop being sick. I felt that. He drew the trees in the picture. I am afraid they are not very good. Best part of it, Polar Bear says. Again, Tolkien roasting his own art. I find that very much the path of the artist. They look more like umbrellas, Father Christmas says. Still, he sends his love to you and all your bears. Why don't you have polar cubs instead of bingos and koalas, he says. Give my love to Christopher and Michael and to John when you next write. Love from Father Christmas. December 23rd, 1940. A message from Polar Bear. Dear Priscilla, glad to find you are back. Message came on Saturday that your house was empty. Was afraid you had gone without leaving any address. Are having a very difficult time this year, but are doing my... My is crossed out our best. Thank you for explaining about your room. Father Christmas sends love. Please excuse Blots. Rather busy. Yours, Polar Bear. So this is a day later on Christmas Eve 1940 from Father Christmas. My dearest Priscilla, just a short letter to wish you a very happy Christmas. Please give my love to Christopher. We are having a rather difficult time this year. This horrible war is reducing all our stocks, and in so many countries, children are living very far from their homes. Polar Bear has a very busy time trying to get our address lists corrected. I am glad you are still at home. I wonder what you will think of my picture. Penguins don't live at the North Pole, you will say. What a smart girl. I know they don't, but we have got some all the same. What you would call evacuees. I believe not a very nice word, except that they did not come here to escape the war, but to find it. They have heard such stories of happenings up in the north, including a quite untrue story that the polar bear and all the polar cubs had been blown up, and that I had been captured by goblins, that they swam all the way to see if they could help me. Nearly 50 arrived. I do like that he is integrating like wartime propaganda into his Christmas letters. The picture is of polar bear dancing with their chiefs. They amuse us enormously. They don't really help much, but are always playing funny dancing games and trying to imitate the walk of polar bear and the cubs. Very much love from your old friend, Father Christmas. So here we see the part of the letters where they really start to shift into, the way I see it is helping Priscilla deal with the war that's happening. And it's very thoughtful, the way he does it. December 22nd, 1941. My dearest Priscilla, I am so glad you did not forget to write me again this year. The number of children who keep up with me seems to be getting smaller. I expect it is because of this horrible war. And then when it is over, things will improve again, and I shall be as busy as ever. But at present, so terribly many people have lost their homes or have left them, half the world seems in the wrong place. And even up here, we have been having troubles. I don't mean only with my stores. Of course, they are getting low. They were already last year, and I have not been able to fill them up. So for that, I have now to send what I can instead of what is asked for. But worse than that has happened. I expect you remember that some years ago we had trouble with the goblins, and we thought we had settled it. Well, it broke out again this autumn, worse than it has been for centuries. We had several battles, and for a while my house was besieged. In November, it began to look likely that it would be captured and all my goods and that Christmas stockings would remain empty all over the world. Would that not have been a calamity? It has not happened, and that is largely due to the efforts of Polar Bear. That's me, says Polar Bear. But it was not until the beginning of this month that I was able to send out any messengers. I expect that goblins thought that with so much war going on, this was a fine chance to recapture the North. 
They must have been preparing for some years, and they made a huge new tunnel which had an outlet many miles away. It was early in October that they suddenly came out in thousands. Polar Bear says that there were at least a million, but that is his favorite big number. There were at least a hundred million, Polar Bear corrects him. Anyway, he was still fast asleep at the time, and I was rather drowsy myself, and the weather was rather warm for the time of year, and Christmas seemed far away. There were only one or two elves about the place, and, of course, Paxu and Valko Tuka, also fast asleep. The penguins had all gone away in the spring. Luckily, goblins cannot help yelling and beating on drums when they mean to fight, so we all woke up in time and got the gates and doors barred and the windows shuttered. Polar Bear got on the roof and fired rockets into the goblin hosts as they poured up the long reindeer drive, but that did not stop them for long. We were soon surrounded. I have not time to tell you all the story. I had to blow three blasts on the great horn known as Windbeam. It hangs over the fireplace in the hall, and if I had not told you about it before, it is because I have not had to blow it for over 400 years. Its sound carries as far as the north wind blows. All the same, it was three whole days before help came. Snowboys, polar bears, and hundreds and hundreds of elves. So, this is the Horn of Elendil, which is also called Windbeam, and it is only blown in great peril. And he would later incorporate this into the Silmarillion and the Lord of the Rings. They came up behind the goblins, and Polar Bear, really awake this time, rushed out with a blazing branch off the fire in each paw. He must have killed dozens of goblins. He says a million. But there was a big battle down in the plain near the North Pole in November, in which the goblins brought hundreds of new companies out of their tunnels. We were driven back to the cliff, and it was not until Polar Bear and a party of his younger relatives crept out by night and blew up the entrance to the new tunnel with nearly 100 pounds of gunpowder that we got the better of them for the present. Bang! Went all the stuff for making fireworks and crackers for some years. The North Pole cracked and fell over for the second time, and we have not yet had time to mend it. Polar Bear is rather a hero. I hope he does not think himself so. I do, says Polar Bear. But of course, he is a very magical animal, really. And goblins can't do much to him when he is awake and angry. I have seen their arrows bouncing off of him and breaking. Well, that will give you some idea of events, and you will understand why I have not had time to draw a picture this year. Rather a pity, because there have been such exciting things to draw. And why I have not been able to collect the usual things for you, or even the very few that you asked for. I am told that nearly all the Alice in Utley books have been burnt, and I could not find one of Moldy Warp. Moldy Warp the Mole is the full name of the book, which I love, it's a children's picture book. I must try and get one for next time. I am sending you a few other books, which I hope you will like. There is not a great deal else, but I send you very much love. It makes me so sad because a few letters ago it was telling them not to fight over the things that are in the stockings, and now it's apologizing that he wasn't able to get her everything that she wanted. It's very sad. I'd like to hear about your bear Bingo, but I think he is too old and important to hang up stockings. But Polar Bear seems to feel that any kind of bear is a relation. As he said to me, Leave it to me, old man. That, I am afraid, is what he often calls me. I will pack a perfectly beautiful selection for his poliness. Yes poliness. So I shall try and bring the beautiful selection along. What it is, I don't know. Very much love from your old friend, Father Christmas and Polar Bear. So this is Christmas Eve 1942. My dear Priscilla, Polar Bear tells me he cannot find my letter from you among this year's piles. I hope he has not lost any. He is so untidy. Still, I expect you have been very busy this autumn at your new school. I have had to guess what you would like. I think I know fairly well, and luckily we are still pretty well off for books and things of that sort. But really, you know, I have never seen my stock so low, or my cellars so full of empty places, as Polar Bear says. I am hoping I shall be able to replenish them before long, though there is so much waste and smashing going on that it makes me rather sad and anxious too. Deliveries, too, are more difficult than ever this year, with damaged houses and houseless people and all the dreadful events going on in your countries. Of course, it is just as peaceful and merry in my land as it ever was. 
We had our snow early this year, and then nice, crisp, frosty nights to keep it white and firm, and bright, starry days. No sun now, of course. I'm giving as big a party tomorrow night as I ever did. Polar cubs, Paksu and Valkotuka, of course, among them, and snow boys and elves. We're having the tree indoors this year, in the hall at the foot of the great staircase, and I hope Polar Bear does not fall down the stairs and crash into it after all is decorated and lit up. I hope you will not mind my bringing this letter along with your things tonight. I am short of messengers, as some have great trouble in finding people and have been away for days. Just now I caught Polar Bear in my pantry and I am sure he has been in the cupboard. I do not know why. He has wrapped up a mysterious parcel, which he wants me to bring to you. Well, not exactly to you. He said, she has got a bear too, as you ought to remember. Well, my dear, here is very much love from Father Christmas once more. And very good wishes from 1943. Polar Bear, of course, sent a special snack along for Billy Bear. It does break my heart that Priscilla didn't write a letter to him this year. It would have been the first year that Tolkien didn't receive a letter from one of his children in 20 years. So this letter is our final one, and it comes from Christmas 1943. My dear Priscilla, a very happy Christmas. I suppose you will be hanging up your stocking just once more. I hope so, for I still have a few little things for you. After this, I shall have to say goodbye. More or less, I mean, I shall not forget you. We always keep the old numbers of our old friends and their letters, and later on we hope to come back when they are grown up and have houses of their own and children. My messengers tell me that people call it grim this year. I think they mean miserable. And so it is, I fear, in many places where I was specially fond of going, but I am very glad to hear that you are not really miserable. <laughs> Don't be. I am still very much alive and shall come back again soon, as merry as ever. There has been no damage in my country, and though my stocks are running low, I hope soon to put that right. Polar Bear, too tired to write himself, so he says, I am, really, Polar Bear interjects, sends a special message to you love and a hug, he says. Do ask if she still has a bear called Silly Billy, or something like that. Or is he worn out? Give my love to the others, John and Michael and Christopher, and of course to all your pets that you used to tell me about. Polar Bear and all the cubs are very well. They have really been very good this year, and have hardly had time to get into any mischief. I hope you will find most of the things that you wanted, and I am very sorry that I have no cat's tongues left, but I have sent nearly all the books you asked for. I hope your stocking will seem full. Very much love. From your old friend, Father Christmas. And that's that. World War II ended a few years after that. I believe there was only two Christmases left before World War II would end after 1943 when that last letter was sent. Either way, the war was on its last legs at the time. And it is kind of a shame that all of the kids aged out during the war, but it is such a beautiful tradition. And a lot of the time when I hear people talking about the letters, they tend to want to discuss like the lore he built around Father Christmas. And I, I think all of that is very cool, sure. And there's things to be learned in it, but I think what is most beautiful about these Christmas letters is the glimpse that we are given into the Tolkien family and Tolkien as a father. Especially when you consider that The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings to some extent were written for his children. Something like this that directly addresses them is just a really, really beautiful way to understand a little bit more about their family. In each of those pages, the love that he had for his children and for his family really just pours out. And I think creativity really was Tolkien's love language. It's how he showed his love for languages, for cultures, for worlds, for stories, and for his family. And this is one of the most direct representations of that that I think we have. Especially because none of this was written or edited for outside consumption. I think it is one of the most 
personal works that we see from him. I am very glad that their family decided to share this with the world because it makes my heart happy. This is the last video I'm going to be putting out before Christmas. Whether you celebrate this holiday or not, I hope that you are able to keep warm and cozy this season and that you and all of the people you love are safe and well, no matter how you choose to make this season special. If this was your first time experiencing these letters, I would love to hear what you think. And if you have read them before, what other thoughts did you have that I didn't get to? Please do let me know in the comments. Either way, this is definitely worth a full read, especially because I wasn't able to read every single word out, so make sure that you check out the full book. Do take a second to like this video if you enjoyed it, and if you want to subscribe, I make videos every single week, and we have a lot of fun over here. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope that you all have a very happy, hobbity holiday.